Today's episode will touch on sensitive topics such as sexual abuse, childhood abuse, physical abuse, suicide, and drug addiction. So if you are sensitive to this content, please listen at your own discretion. What is art without the muse? Many of Western art's most famous works are depictions of women. But who were these women? Do they have their own stories to share with the world? Hello and welcome to Art Muse, a podcast that aims to reshape the ways in which we interpret well-known works of art by paying dues to the women whose images have been immortalized, but whose names and stories have been wrongfully overlooked. While these women's faces are familiar to viewers around the world, their identities have been largely forgotten. Together we will explore the important lives and legacy of the female muse and appreciate these works of art from a new perspective, through the eyes of the women whose image stares back at us. Is the muse in actuality just as, if not more, important than the artists themselves? And I'm your host, Grace Anna. Welcome to part two of our two-part episode on Gala Dali. In part one, we explored Gala's childhood, how she met her first husband, Paul Elulard, and traveled alone through Europe in the midst of World War I to be with him, their marriage and later menage a relationship with Max Ernst, and finally the fateful meeting of Gala and Dali. We left things off in our story when Gala officially left Elulard for Dali, sealing the deal with a request for their divorce. So let's dive back in. Gala and Elulard divorced in 1932. Elulard, heartbroken, wrote to Gala, I've put my whole life in the love I have for you. I've put my whole life in our life. Elulard decided to sell the apartment that represented the now lost life with Gala. He entered a relationship with a German actress named Nusch, who he eventually married in 1934. But despite his love and care for Nusch, Elulard could never fully move on from Gala, his irreplaceable first love, and he continued to send her love letters well after their divorce. Cecile, who went into the primary care of her grandmother, also did not take her mother's leave well. Gala's sister, who was visiting from Russia at the time, remembers Cecile sobbing as she pleaded with her mother to stay. As a teenager, she was old enough to understand the magnitude of the situation and was actively opposed to her parents' divorce. She became so distressed over her family situation that she developed a serious spinal disorder. Cecile had to be sent to a sanatorium in Switzerland for several months to recover. We can only imagine how distressing this must have been for Cecile whose heart ached with devastation over her abandonment. But it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for Gala, either. Moving back to Kadakis, Gala and Dali were refused a room at the town's only hotel because Dali's father had blacklisted them. They had to be secretly sheltered by one of Dali's old servants, who took pity on them. They eventually purchased and moved into a fisherman's shack along the port. The shack was a massive downgrade from Gala's lavish life in Paris. It was almost pathetically small and had no electricity, heat, or running water. The sea's damp air was extremely detrimental to Gala's weak lungs and her health suffered. But the shack was on beautiful land with olive trees and rose-covered hills. And despite the far from favorable conditions, Gala must have sensed the beautiful horizon ahead. As bright a promise as Dali's creative genius might have given off, these beginning years were rough. Dali's career struggled to gain traction, and he received few to no commissions. Gala would march all over Paris, attempting to sell Dali's works, but despite her best efforts, they remained in poverty. They did their best to conceal their dire financial situation by living a largely hermetic life, and Gala and Dali isolated themselves from the outside world. 
Locked inside, Dali channeled his anxieties into his creations, while Gala pulled tarot cards and used her mediumistic gifts to receive messages about the future. As Dali once said, Gala is a true medium in the scientific sense of the word. Gala is never, never, never wrong. She reads cards with a paralyzing sureness. Whether Gala could predict the future or not, her supernatural practices provided an almost blind faith that kept Gala and Dali going through even the most trying of times. During this formative time in Dali's early career, Gala was far more than just a romantic partner and clairvoyant. Gala was Dali's guide, protector, and in many ways acted as a mother to him. It was Gala who taught the fragile and fear-filled Dali how to survive. Dali later wrote that it was Gala who showed him, quote, how to dress, how to go down a stairway without falling 36 times, how to not be continually losing the money we had, how to eat without tossing the chicken bone at the ceiling, how to recognize our enemies, so that while in relation to the outside world, I assumed more and more the appearance of a fortress. And more than this, she established herself as a co-creator and conceptualizer, who played an essential part in Dali's creative process. Gala would critique and scrutinize each and every one of Dali's paintings before he showed them to the public. She worked side by side on Dali's pavilion for the World Fair in New York, together creating a bizarre surrealist world where visitors entered through a pair of women's legs. She co-authored ambitious writing projects such as Dream of Venus and co-produced several surrealist objects. She was so involved that by the 1930s, Dali began to sign his canvases with both his and Gala's names. And he once said, it is with your blood, Gala, that I paint my pictures. And it was also with her face that Dali painted his pictures. It didn't take long for Gala to make her way to the center stage of Dali's canvases. By the 1930s, images of Gala dominated Dali's works. In one, titled Portrait of Gala with Two Lamb Chops in Equilibrium Upon Her Shoulder, painted in 1934, we see a smirking Gala with her eyes closed as she balances lamb chops on her shoulder. In another portrait of Gala painted the following year, we see Gala seated in front of one of Dali's paintings, staring face to face with her own mirrored image. In these paintings, Gala is unafraid to be herself, even within the surrealist landscapes of Dali's painted worlds. There is no doubt that it was Gala who directed the rendering of her own image. We cannot imagine Gala passively posing as Dali painted her portrait. She inserted herself into the canvases that Dali then painted, and Gala makes this clear as she stares at the viewer, both self-possessed and proud. Gala not only co-conceptualized Dali's artwork and her own image within those works, but soon became Dali's full-time manager. She knew that success was within their reach, and she had the foresight to know what was needed to get there. As Gala never aspired to be an artist or writer herself, her creative strength was intuiting what artists needed to reach their highest potential, and then leading them to success. Gala was the creative genius behind the creation of Dali's public persona. By turning Dali's personality into performance, Gala made Dali one of the first artists to become art themselves, his looks and personality curated. This was a completely pioneering way to think about the role of the artist in society and paved the way for future artistic personas like Andy Warhol. Gala turned Dali from painter to phenomenon, and it was with this shift that Dali's career really took off. During this period, Gala threw herself into marketing and selling Dali's work. Gala was extremely innovative in her quest to jumpstart Dali's career. She came up with the idea for an exclusive club, which she named the Zodiac Club, 
which included 12 well-off patrons who would enter a lottery with the submission of 2,500 francs, and the winner would receive Dali's latest work. It was an ingenious marketing plan well before its time that allotted Dali income to get by as they established his reputation. And Gala acted as Dali's liaison and would translate his artistic visions into words for collectors and gallerists to understand. It was also Gala who negotiated and signed Dali's contracts and took full charge of his business affairs. She was the one who set Dali's prices and insisted that he be paid in cash or money order, not trusting checks. Gala proved to be a shrewd businesswoman who wasn't opposed to playing cheap tricks in her dealings. She was notorious for quoting prices in pasetas and then pretending the deal was made in dollars to get significantly more money. Behind her back, dealers in Paris gave Gala the nickname La Gaulle, slang for spiteful person. Despite her efforts, Gala knew that the best way to achieve the level of success that both Gala and Dali sought after was by commercializing Dali's work. In 1933, Gala made the decision to travel with Dali to New York in hopes of expanding his exposure and reeling in American collectors. Gala and Dali had to scrape together enough money to buy their third-class tickets for a steamboat to New York. Dali, who was terrified of travel, clung to the confident Gala as they made their way across the Atlantic. And it was well worth the taxing journey and costs. Gala and Dali arrived in New York at a fortuitous time, when American museums and galleries were looking to build their collections of surrealist art. And New York ate Dali right up. Gala had New Yorkers convinced that Dali was the leader of the surrealists, though in reality he was nearly excommunicated from the group. New York's Museum of Modern Art purchased Dali's The Persistence of Memory. Dali landed a solo show at the renowned gallery run by Julian Levy, and was featured on the cover of Time magazine. Rich American collectors began commissioning their portraits by Dali. In just a few weeks spent in New York, Gala and Dali earned more money and publicity than ever was possible in Europe. Overnight, Dali's paintings soared in value, and he was officially famous. As Dali's career progressed, Gala and Dali's relationship also deepened. In 1934, they were married in a civil ceremony, a romantic but also practical gesture, as it now ensured that if Dali were to die, Gala would inherit his amassed wealth. They had also fallen into the swing of their different sexual preferences and had come to an agreement that satisfied both. Dali, who was a virgin when he met Gala, had a strong aversion to sex, stemming from a phobia developed in childhood. While they did have sex at least once, the two rarely engaged in physical intimacy. Dali much preferred voyeurism, and Gala, with a sexual voraciousness and a preference for promiscuity, was more than happy to put on a show. Dali enjoyed the idea of Gala sleeping with other men, and Gala's numerous affairs were a way to keep both Gala and Dali sexually satisfied. The lack of sex in their relationship did not impact their strengthening emotional intimacy. Dali famously once said that he loved Gala, quote, more than my mother, more than my father, more than Picasso, and even more than money. And a friend of Gala's recalled, quote, Gala would read the mind of Dali and of other people. She did everything for him. I'm sure she even brushed his teeth. There was no doubt that she was in love with Dali, but as a sister with a brother. Perhaps more familial than sexual by nature, Gala and Dali's love for one another was both unique and unfaltering. And Dali, for both his personal and professional needs, was becoming more and more dependent on Gala. But Gala would have to depend on Dali as well. Her health issues of youth did not subside with age. When she was 36, while living in their poorly insulated fisherman's shack, Gala fell ill with pleurisy, and Dali had to travel with her to Barcelona to receive proper medical care. 
Gala looked so severely ill that Dali was convinced she was dying. And even after recovery, she continued to have labored breathing for an entire year. They eventually decided to move to Paris so that Gala could see specialists. After several tests and x-rays, doctors in Paris were finally able to diagnose the root problem, a fibrous tumor growing inside her lung, which had to be surgically removed. It was a serious surgery, and Ali panicked over the potential of something going wrong. He had such bad anxiety that he couldn't even bring himself to visit Gala in the hospital. But Gala barely batted an eye as she was brought onto the operating table. And luckily, the operation proved successful. The removal of the tumor alleviated the lung problems that had plagued Gala for most of her life once and for all, and she recovered swiftly. But her improved health did not last for long. In 1931, Gala began experiencing concerning gynecological symptoms and doctors located a second tumor, this time in her uterus, which would also need to be surgically removed. This procedure was far more dangerous and painful than the first, and it would have permanent consequences. The removal of Gala's uterus would make her sterile for the rest of her life. How did Gala feel as she lay on the operating table, knowing that she would never again be able to have a child? that her body would be forever changed. Despite her resilience, the seriousness of this procedure caused Gala to suffer significant emotional distress. Gala was afraid to have sex for many months after the procedure. She would commiserate to friends for decades to come that the doctors had emptied her completely. The experience seemed to permanently shift Gala. Her behavior became more reckless perhaps her various health battles pushing her to live life as intensely and fully as possible. A few months after her surgery, once Gala's fear of having sex again subsided, she developed nymphomania, which lasted the rest of her life. It seemed that the surgery left a void that she was constantly trying to fill through various affairs. When they returned to their fisherman's shack, Gala would regularly sail out with different fishermen with the sole intention of having sex with them. The fishermen, often several years younger than Gala, would end up having a sexual education on these escapades. The surgery also seemed to harden Gala's personality. Her health challenges, along with Gala's increasing role in Dali's career and his rising stardom, turned Gala tyrannical. Dali would refer to her as his little lion, A friend of hers compared her to a bullet fired over a desert. Another friend remembers Gala inviting her over for dinner and serving her own cooked pet rabbit. And if her surgeries hadn't hardened her enough, the impending Spanish Civil War and World War II certainly would. In 1934, Gala and Dali had to narrowly escape Spain with exit visas just before the start of the Civil War. They managed to arrange a driver to take them to France for a significant sum of money, where they passed militia and almost got rounded up by a gang of armed men. Though they made it to France safely, they later found out that their driver was killed by a stray bullet on his return to Spain, and that over 30 of the fishermen living in their community had been gunned down. Gala and Dali took refuge in Arcachon, a small seaside town in southern France. Gala became consumed with trying to predict the outcome of the war. She would spend hours pulling tarot, but the same cards kept reoccurring. Death and the devil. She even accurately predicted the very day that Hitler would invade France. Soon after Gala's premonition, refugees from Paris began pouring into Arcachon with horror stories of the Nazis' occupation. Worried about Dali's paintings, Gala made the treacherous trip into the Nazi-occupied Paris to salvage as many of Dali's paintings as she could from their apartment. Upon her return, Gala and Dali escaped France in the middle of the night, still in their night robes, fleeing to America. 
Gala's daughter, Cecile, was also put in a perilous position by the Nazis' invasion. Terrified, she fled Paris for Arcachon, hoping to meet her mother. But Gala and Dali had already arrived in the U.S. Cecile desperately wrote to Gala for money, but Gala couldn't send money from abroad. So she offered Cecile her and Dali's apartment to take shelter in. Though a gesture of kindness, this offer would eventually damage Gala and Cecile's relationship irreparably. In need of money, Cecile sold many of Dali's paintings and much of the apartment's furniture. When Gala discovered this, she flew into a rage and swore never to speak to her daughter again a promise that Gala unfortunately seemed to keep. Gala and Dali arrived in New York on August 16, 1940. World War II could not stop Gala from her quest to elevate Dali to celebrity status. And where better to be a celebrity than Hollywood? After some time in New York, Gala and Dali moved to a bungalow in Monterey. While Dali was busy painting his portraits of actors and actresses, charging up to $25,000 per painting, Gala would take long drives in her Cadillac down the coast. We can imagine the petite Gala, her feet barely being able to reach the pedal, cruising down the Pacific coast as the warm breeze hit her face. Though the world was in shambles, Gala Dali was living her best life. Gala was also living her best life within the painted worlds of Dali's canvases. Gala features in many of Dali's paintings from the 40s and 50s, often painted as a Madonna or goddess-like figure. In Dream Caused by the Flight of a Bee Around a Pomegranate a Second Before Waking, painted in 1944, Gala is pictured as a naked sleeping Venus-esque woman, lying with her arms behind her head. She reclines peacefully and seductively in a surrealist world, with tigers being birthed from a pomegranate lunging towards her and an elephant with stilt-like legs floating above. Just as Gala evaded World War II unscathed, here too she basks in her own glory amidst the surrounding chaos. In Gala Rina, painted the following year, Dali paints what is perhaps the most straightforward portrait of Gala, but even when painted traditionally, any portrait of Gala is far from ordinary. In conversation with Raphael's La Fornarina, in which Raphael paints his lover bare-breasted, Gala stares at the viewer, also offering her left breast. Her arms are crossed with self-conviction, and her elusive expression gives the impression that she is unfazed by her exposure. Gala does not need to be placed in a lavish surrealist world for us to be left with a sense of awe. And in the Madonna of Portly Gott, painted a few years later in 1949, we see Gala rendered as the Virgin Mary, levitating over the fisherman village Gala has called home for many years. The irony being, of course, that Gala was far from a virgin and resentful of her role as a mother, a far cry from the Madonna. But it seemed that the more dishonest and disgraceful Gala's behavior in life became, her depictions in Dali's paintings turned more and more saint-like. This discrepancy between her painted depictions and outward behavior became all the more extreme when Gala and Dali's own bond began to deteriorate. As Dali painted Gala as saints and goddesses, she was slowly but surely turning demonic in their relationship, taking advantage of Dali's blind trust in her. Dali, who now depended on Gala for his day-to-day -day survival, must have been in denial over who Gala had become and doubled down on the holiness of the woman he loved. By the 1940s, Gala's increasing reckless affairs and worsening temper began to strain Gala and Dali's romantic and working relationship. Gala's push for Dali towards commercialism began to backfire. His fellow surrealists called him a sellout, and his reputation began to plummet. Gala encouraged Dali to lend his name to any project that paid well, at the expense of Dali's artistic integrity. 
In one instance, Dali even took on a commission to paint a Hollywood studio boss's dachshund. Gala was no longer concerned with Dali's artistry. Taking full control of his income, she needed more and more money to keep up with her reckless life choices. Her preference for younger men began to get expensive, often buying lavish gifts for her lovers to lure them in. Gala also became addicted to gambling, particularly roulette, and began gambling away massive amounts of money. Not only would Gala pressure Dali to take on any commission that paid, regardless of the humiliation, she would allegedly lock Dali in his studio and not allow him to leave until he had finished a painting. Realizing that his output could not keep up with her increasing need for money, Gala convinced Dali to sign 35,000 blank sheets of paper. She sold them to editors for high sums of money, who could place any image they liked and pass it as a Dali original. This resulted in thousands of fraudulent Dali works circulating the market, and actually continue to surface the market today. Gala kept her money-squandering habits from Dali, and opened a separate bank account for gambling. She insisted on Dali being paid in cash. As a gallerist remembered, quote, Gala never took money calmly. She seized it. She began to hoard checks, her purse bursting with undeposited checks totaling thousands of dollars. Gala became equally irritable and merciless in her personal life. By the late 1940s, Gala and Dali's age difference became more noticeable. On nights out, Gala, now in her 50s, felt increasingly insecure that all eyes seemed to be on her younger and handsome husband. Despite her own numerous affairs, Gala would get extremely jealous of the women who surrounded themselves around Dali. As a friend remembered, quote, Gala was consumed with jealousy. She thought that another woman, younger and prettier, would steal Dali away from her. After all the hard times she had dragged him through, she was suspicious of other women. Gala would often storm out of these parties to go on dates with younger men. From the 1960s onwards, Gala's hostility only intensified, and her behavior turned more and more sadistic. If someone bothered her, she was known to spit in their face or stub a lit cigarette onto their bare skin. There are records of her elbowing waiters and kicking art dealers and delivery men. And it wasn't just strangers on the receiving end of her wrath. Her own daughter Cecile fell victim to Gala's furious temper. When Cecile had her first child, Gala refused to meet her grandchild and revoked her role as grandparent. When Paul Elulard passed away, Gala not only chose not to attend the funeral of her first husband, but told her daughter that she never wished to speak with her again. In the 1970s, when Cecile was in her 50s, Cecile came to Spain in hopes of repairing her relationship with Gala. She came and knocked on Gala's front door every single day for three months straight, but Gala never answered. Instead, she watched Cecile from her bedroom window, which overlooked the entrance, and took pleasure in Cecile's growing desperateness. In a rare interview in her later age, Gala remarked that she wanted to live her life like a constant explosion of rage, and she certainly seemed to succeed in that. She would send away anyone she found unattractive from her presence. And in fact, she seemed to find her own self unattractive. In 1967, when she celebrated her 70th birthday, she scissored out her own face from any photograph taken that day. How Gala may have felt about her own appearance did not stop her from continuing to have numerous affairs in late age. Those who knew her said that Gala had the libido of an electric eel, and the older Gala got, the younger the men she desired. This seemed to stem not only from a sexual preference for younger men, but perhaps also the desire to recreate the sexual experiences she had in her youth. 
young men were known to flee when Gala approached, despite her attempts to lure them in with money and original Dali works. And Gala would never forget or forgive anyone who had rejected her advances, an ever-growing list as she grew older and older. One such man was Jimmy Ernst, the son of Max Ernst. Despite the fact that Jimmy was the son of her former fling and was only an infant when she first met Max Ernst and who was abandoned with his mother after Ernst left them for Gala, when Gala encountered Jimmy by chance in New York City one day, she could not resist the urge to seduce him. She was well into her 60s and Jimmy only 19 years old. After inviting Jimmy to go shopping with her and Dali the next day, Jimmy was surprised to find instead Gala alone, who whisked him off to an intimate lunch at the Russian tea room. Jimmy remembered Gala whispering to him, I knew you as a small baby, and she began to play footsie with him. Jimmy managed to evade her sexual advances and quickly left the Russian tea room leaving a furious Gala behind. But plenty of men did not refuse Gala's advances, and those who willingly accepted Gala's propositions did not do so solely because she showered them with expensive gifts. Even in her 70s and 80s, Gala seemed to have a sexual power over men, even men decades her younger. She had a string of regular lovers, one a Greek pianist, another a young philosopher named Michael Pastori, and it was often Gala who would end things with these men. A friend of Michael Pastori remembers Michael being so emotionally distraught after Gala broke things off with him that Michael retreated to a monastery to seek spiritual guidance. One of the more significant relationships Gala had in her late life was with the man named William Rotlein. In 1963, when Gala was 67 years old, she was being driven in her Cadillac through Brooklyn when she noticed a dark and handsome man in the doorway of a tenement building. The man in his 20s, thin and with marks up his arm, was quite clearly using drugs. But as Gala asked her driver to come to a stop, she couldn't believe how much this man resembled a young Dali. She lowered her window and called out to him in her Russian accent, inviting him into her Cadillac, which he obliged. When Gala arrived at the St. Regis Hotel with her new companion, the front desk could almost not believe their eyes. Here Gala was, ushering in a man in the throes of drug addiction to one of the most prestigious hotels in the city. Gala kept William in a room playing nurse and weaning him off heroin. After a few days, Gala was successful, but William's dependence on drugs soon transferred to a dependence on Gala. This was exactly what Gala intended. Like a young Dali, she once again had a young and impressionable man who turned to her for his survival. And thus was the start to their romantic fling. The pair would sleep until two in the afternoon, embracing each other over a very late breakfast. Gala confessed to a friend that she loved William more than she ever loved anyone else, including Paul Ellulard and Dali. She became convinced that with his good looks, he could become the next greatest film actor. She even flew him out to Rome and arranged a meeting with the film director Fellini who found William to have little talent as an actor. The couple traveled around Italy, even confessing their eternal love to each other in Verona, at Romeo and Juliet's grave. But soon William began to pressure Gala to divorce Dali and instead marry him. What at first seemed to be a fun affair was quickly becoming more serious and suffocating than Gala could handle. She left William in Turin and flew back to Spain to Dali. William, abandoned in a foreign country and without a clue as to how to survive without Gala, stood naked in distress on a rooftop and threatened suicide. Gala finally bought William a first-class ticket back to New York, 
but she herself remained in Spain, refusing to ever see him again. And this was just the warm-up. Gala was yet to enter her most serious and most ridiculous relationship of her late life. In 1973, the musical Jesus Christ Superstar was all the rage in New York. Though Gala never attended Broadway plays, when she saw pictures of the cast, she was immediately drawn to the actor playing Jesus, Jeff Fenholt. She asked Dali to invite him to one of Dali's famous tea parties. When Jeff entered the room, Gala was so taken aback by his good looks that she rose to her feet, a welcome she didn't even give to royalty. As Gala locked eyes with the young actor, she was overcome with passion. Even though she was almost 80 years old and Jeff only in his 20s, Gala was determined to claim the Jesus Christ Superstar as her own. That tea party would forever change the course of Jeff Fenholt's life. Gala and Jeff would embark on a seven-year-long relationship. Despite their massive age difference and the fact that Jeff was married with a child, he could not turn down the allure of all that Gala promised him in return for a romantic partnership. And there were a lot of perks. Even after his run at Jesus Christ Superstar was over, Gala continued to call Jeff Jesus Christ, stroking his notoriously big ego. She championed his work and committed herself to helping his singing career take off. And without Dolly's knowledge or consent, Gala bought Jeff a $1.25 million home on Long Island and showered him with original works by Dali which totaled a small fortune. Gala utterly worshipped Jeff, and it was quite clear to others that she loved him much more than he loved her. And even if Jeff may have been manipulating Gala for his own gain, Gala was still getting her fair share of the bargain. For Gala, Jeff was the ideal distraction from facing the approaching end of her life. With Jeff, Gala could live in the delusion that she was still as sexually powerful and influential on artists' careers as she had been in the past. Gala admitted to a friend, I feel like his grandmother and his lover. But this did not deter Gala from becoming consumed by their relationship. Much of their time together was spent in a castle that Dali purchased for Gala in 1969. Gala had always dreamt of having a castle. Dali, endlessly eager to please Gala, despite her continued emotional torment, found a 12th century castle in a tiny village in Spain called Pubal Castle. From the start, Pubal Castle was Gala's domain. Despite purchasing the castle, Dali could only visit if he received a written invitation from Gala. His presence could only be found in the murals Dali painted at the castle. As Dali wrote in his memoir, quote, I limited myself to the pleasure of decorating her ceilings so that when she raised her eyes, she could always find me in her sky. The only person who did not require an invitation was Jeff Fenholt. Gala and Jeff spent seven consecutive summers together at Pubel. Though the castle was meant to be Gala's private space, she bought Jeff a grand piano and filled the space with expensive equipment for his music making. Gala also adorned the wall above her bed with a huge crucifix. We can imagine Gala canoodling in bed with the young Jesus Christ superstar, the Holy Cross hanging high above their heads. Yet despite her young lover, Gala could not escape the inevitable ticking time clock of age. In February 1980, Gala and Ali both caught a severe case of the flu. They were confined to their room at the St. Regis Hotel in New York. This would be the last winter that Gala would spend in America. Gala passed much of this time with one of her few friends, whom she would read tarot cards with. It seems that in her last years of life, Gala turned more and more towards spirituality. It's likely that fostering her connection with the occult may have provided a sense of inner peace 
as she faced her life's end. Though Gala recovered from the flu, Dali did not, and under the advice of their doctor, the couple flew back to Spain where Dali was admitted into a clinic in Barcelona. The doctors told Gala that Dali would likely never recover his full physical and mental health again. How did Gala feel as she witnessed the degradation of the man she had spent the last 50 years with side by side? Did she feel any guilt for the way she had treated Dali? Did it make her fear her own impending doom? Sadly, it wasn't just Gala and Dali's health that was waning, but their relationship continued to crumble, now at a rapid rate. Gala's obsession with Jeff Fenholt began to test Dali's tolerance of Gala's affairs. Dali began to feel increasingly cast aside and that his relationship with Gala was no longer given priority. As Dali's health continued to decline, he would request Gala to be at his bedside more and more frequently. But Gala often eloped with Jeff, abandoning Dali, and the time she did remain with Dali, she was filled with resentment that he was keeping her from her young lover. It was around this time that Gala began drugging Dali with tranquilizers and amphetamines. For years, Gala was in charge of administering Dali's medicine. Whether purposefully to unburden herself from Dali's neediness and return to Jeff, or accidentally, as she became more and more senile, Gala began giving Dali a dangerous drug concoction. These drugs had fatal reactions with the treatments doctors had administered to Dali. It became more and more likely that Dali, who had been experiencing symptoms akin to Parkinson's disease, was dealing with the effects of toxic medicinal mixtures rather than the natural development of the disease. He was eventually diagnosed with drug-induced Parkinson's. Dali had lost the loyalty of his wife and now also the ability to move his body, including to paint, without shaking uncontrollably. Years of pent-up rage came to a boiling point. Gala and Dali began to verbally and physically assault one another. In one instance, Dali fell on the sidewalk, and Gala began to beat him with his cane, cursing him under her breath with each strike. In February of 1981, Gala landed in the hospital with two broken ribs, lesions on her leg and arm, and bruises all over her side body. At first, Dolly told the doctors that Gala had fallen off of her bed. But doctors became suspicious when they noticed that Dolly also had a black eye. Dolly finally admitted to striking the 87-year-old Gala repeatedly with his cane, and that she punched him in his face in defense. This last major fight was sparked when Dali discovered that Gala had not only given Fenholt a multitude of expensive gifts, including the multi-million dollar home in Long Island, but also many of Dali's paintings. Dali only discovered this when Jeff auctioned off his collection of Dali's paintings at Christie's. Dali felt utterly betrayed by Gala, who was not only casting him aside for her younger lover, but he was unknowingly funding their affair. For Dali, this was the final straw, and his previously unconditional love for Gala began to diminish. With her new injuries and increasing dementia, Gala was becoming too compromised to visit her beloved Jeff. Instead of being sympathetic, Jeff began to openly see other women and denied that he and Gala had a sexual relationship. But despite his disrespectful behavior, when Gala and Jeff officially ended, Jeff joined the long list of distraught men who couldn't seem to get over Gala. As Jeff later remembered, Gala was good for me, and bad too. She inspired me so much that I became destructive. I tried to shut out the world with booze and drugs. Jeff was so shattered over his break from Gala that he became a singer for the heavy metal band Black Sabbath. Gala had officially turned the Jesus Christ superstar to the dark side. 
On February 24, 1982, at the age of 87, Gala had to receive emergency surgery to remove her gallbladder. While recovering at home, she slipped in her bathroom and broke her thigh bone. Though she was rushed to the emergency clinic in Barcelona, she was too weak to endure another surgery, and there was nothing the doctors could safely do. They knew that Gala's death was now near. Gala was sent back home to Portligat, where they placed a sickbed next to Dali. But Gala's condition only worsened. She refused to eat and began to have hallucinations of spirits. Due to her weakened immune system, her skin broke out in terrible and unsightly sores. By April, it became increasingly obvious that Gala was dying. Dali and his assistants began a rushed construction of a crypt for Gala at Pubal Castle, where Gala wished to be buried. They called a priest to come to the house to bless Gala as she passed. They surrounded her bed with crucifixes, and Gala was dressed in a white silk blouse, giving her an almost ghostly appearance. But in typical Gala fashion, Gala clung onto life with fierce determination. Weeks passed after the priest's visit, and Gala continued to slip in and out of consciousness. Her daughter Cecile rushed from France to Spain to say goodbye to her mother, but Gala awoke from her unconscious state just in time to refuse Cecile at the door. Even from her deathbed, Gala wanted nothing to do with her daughter. Cecile, rearing from humiliation, stumbled away from the house, never to see or speak to her mother again. Gala's long and drawn-out decline was torturous to Dali, who was not only reminded of the grim reality that his wife was dying on a daily basis, but was exhausted over having to take care of her. Dali eventually requested a screen to be put between Gala and his bed, so he could drown out her nightly screams and gasps for air. As Gala took her last breaths, refusing her daughter and now separated from her husband, Gala must have felt incredibly alone. Gala had once said, the day I die will be the best day of my life. On the morning of June 12th, that day had finally arrived. Just as the early morning light beamed in through Gala's window, Dali tiptoed over to Gala to be met with her lifeless eyes. Gala Dali passed away in the early hours that morning, with just the sun as her witness. Gala was 87 years old. Despite the months of Gala's prolonged passing, Dali fell back in shock and entered a state of denial. He could not believe that a force as strong as Gala's could no longer exist. Gala's death posed another problem. Gala died in the fisherman village of Port Ligat, but her crypt was at Pubal Castle. Spanish law forbade the moving of any corpse until a judge had seen the body. This would make it impossible for Gala to be buried where she desired. A highly illegal plan was devised to prop Gala's body in her Cadillac and drive her to Pupa Castle. She was stripped and bundled in a blanket, her corpse enjoying its last journey to her private lair. Gala safely arrived at Pubal and was slid between her sheets, making it seem that she had died in her bed. When she was ready to be buried, her assistants dressed Gala in her favorite red velvet dress and strapped on her head her Chanel black bow. Gala descended into her private crypt in her private castle, dressed in the only clothes she would accept being remembered in. As Dali's shock subsided, his devastation set in. He locked himself in Gala's bedroom at Pubal Castle, drew all the curtains, and refused to eat. Though their relationship had been complicated at best, without Gala, Dali seemed to lose all will to paint, or even to live. He became emaciated and malnourished, a walking skeleton whose soul seemed to die along with Gala's. 
Dali survived Gala only a few years before he died on January 23, 1989. Cecile suffered over Gala's mistreatment of her for the rest of her life. After Gala's death, she sued in order to inherit her rightful portion of Gala's fortune, which Gala had tried to forbid her from receiving. She married and divorced four different times. Perhaps her wounded heart was always searching for a love that she never received from Gala. In an interview from 2014, two years before Cecile's death, she said it was still too painful for her to talk about Gala, who she considered a monster. Gala's legacy today lives on through the Gala Salvador Dali Foundation. The Gala Dali Castle of Pubal has been open to the public since 1996. More recently, in 2018, the National Art Museum in Barcelona put on an exhibition titled Gala Salvador Dali, A Room of One's Own in Pubal, which explored Gala's immense contribution to not only Dali's artistic career, but several other important surrealist artists. Though Salvador Dali is today one of the most famous artists of the 20th century. Gala Dali remains in his shadows. Those that do remember Gala make her out to be an almost demonic character who cheapened Dali's career, had an insatiable appetite for gambling and sex, and in her later years was a sexual predator. While these things are not untrue, how different was Gala from someone like Pablo Picasso? who also dated women in their 20s when he was well into his 80s and had a long and brutal track record of physical and emotional abusive behavior. Why is Gala Dali written off as a monstrous character and Picasso celebrated as the best artist of our time? Had Gala been a man, would she be so harshly criticized? My hope is that we can look critically at Gala's life without the double standard of sexism that Gala has been unfairly victim to. Gala deserves to be remembered as the complicated character that she was. Gala could certainly be vicious, unforgiving, and cruel. It is almost impossible to justify her brutal treatment of her daughter, Cecile. She ended her relationship with Paul Ellulard coldly and despite the continuous support and forgiveness he extended to Gala after their divorce, she didn't even bother to attend his funeral. Her treatment of Dali is in many ways of equal concern. Dali, an especially wounded and vulnerable individual, was completely dependent on Gala for his survival. She clearly enjoyed her dominant role in his life and career. And in the last decades of their relationship, she cold-heartedly squandered much of Dali's earnings on gambling and young men without his knowledge, forced Dali to paint, at times even locking him in his studio and withholding food, drugged Dali with medication that not only sedated him, but made him develop a nervous disorder, and verbally and physically assaulted him, which, to be fair, he in return did to Gala as well. Gala exhibited predatory behavior with many of the young men she came on to, such as Jimmy Ernst, and in many of her affairs, Gala seemed to have preyed on the vulnerable. But there is also a lot of reasons to admire Gala. She showed immense strength in overcoming her various health adversities. She traveled by herself across Europe at the peak of World War I, at the wee age of 21, and many years later, she narrowly escaped the Spanish Civil War and then the Nazis' invasion of France. From her early days with Paul Ellulard, she exhibited a rare and undeniable talent for inspiring artists to mature into the best versions of themselves and produce their best work. And not just in the sense of a muse, but by actively co-directing works and taking charge of the management of their careers. She inspired Paul Ellulard, Max Ernst, Giorgio de Carico, and of course Salvador Dali, some of the greatest artists of the 20th century. And despite her treatment of Dali in later years, it can be safely said that Dali would not be a household name 
or had made the works that we treasure today without Gala. Gala not only saw in Dali a rare talent, but intuited what he needed to bring his career into full fruition. And while Gala always believed in Dali, she helped the fear-stricken artist believe in himself, the key to unlocking Dali's true artistic ambition. It should not be overlooked that Gala organized and edited Dali's writing, managed Dali's entire career, helped Dali create several surrealist objects, scrutinized each of his paintings until they were the best that they could be, and directed her own image into many of Dali's greatest works. Dali's paintings that feature Gala are far more than just portraits. They serve as a pictorial autobiography in which Gala crafted and fashioned her own image. Is it possible that the muse was the artist and the artist the muse? That Gala hid behind the guise of muse while carving her own career and path as a conceptual artist? As Moltz Auger, the director of the Dali Museum wrote, Gala always felt more comfortable in the shadows, but like Dali, she also wanted to become a legend one day. So today, we honor the legend of Gala Dali. Whether critical of Gala's behavior or not, one cannot deny that she was a force to be reckoned with. Gala was a woman who had achieved financial and sexual freedom that few women of her time could ever dream of enjoying. She knew the rules of accepted social behavior and decidedly ignored them. She was unafraid to live her life authentically and remained fiercely herself. As the French surrealist writer André Theron remembered, Gala knew what she wanted, the pleasures of the heart and the senses, money and companionship of genius. It's true. Gala knew the life she wanted to live and was unwilling to let her size, her gender, two world wars, or any force opposing her get in her way. And while some of Gala's behavior was undoubtedly problematic at best and criminal at worst, she was guilty of what men like Picasso had done and gotten away with for centuries. As James Brown once sang, this is a man's man's world, but it would be nothing without a woman or a girl. And in the man's world in which Gala existed, this tiny Russian fireball of a woman came out on top. I hope you have enjoyed this two-part episode on Gala Dali. I have included images, resources, and suggestions for further reading on the Art Muse website and Instagram. Art Muse is produced by Kula Production Company. Today's episode was written by me, your host, Grace Anna. Stay tuned as I continue to share the stories of the women behind some of the world's most important works of art. Until next time, bye for now. <laughs>